Welcome. Today, we are uh, strapping in for a deep dive into the source material, covering something pretty special, a close encounter. A very close encounter. We're talking about a visitor from another star system. Exactly. Yeah. And it's putting on a show basically right next door to Mars. Mm -hmm. This is Interstellar Comet 3 Iolis, and you really need to register that name and number. 3 I Day Iolis. Okay, got it. Because this object is only the third confirmed visitor, you know, ever observed by humanity that came from totally outside our solar system. Wow, only the third. Yeah, so this isn't just like a stray rock. It's a real sample of what the universe is made of way beyond our sun's influence. Okay, that rarity is definitely the hook then. The sources we looked at confirm scientists are in this, well, frantic but excited rush. Absolutely, because this flyby, this historic event, is happening basically now. Giving us this amazing chance to observe it up close. Okay, let's unpack the timeline. How did we even spot this thing? Well, the timeline was tight, really aggressive. 3 Aeolus was only discovered back in July 2025. Just a few months ago. Exactly. By NASA's Actiles Telescope, the one down in Chile. So that gave the global astronomy community, you know, just a handful of months. To do what? Track it? Confirm it's interstellar? Uh-huh. Track its path, confirm the origin, and then mobilize, well, everything available nearby. And that interstellar label is key here, isn't it? Oh, absolutely critical. It means this object wasn't born from the same cloud of gas and dust that made, you know, our sun, Earth, Jupiter. It came from a completely different star. Born around another star, flung out maybe eons ago, and it's just now passing through our neighborhood, a temporary visitor. So its composition, its path. It's literally like a message in a bottle from another solar system. Precisely. If we can figure out what it's made of, yeah. we get this direct chemical snapshot of a totally different stellar nursery. The scientific value is just, well, it's huge, almost incalculable. And the main event, this close pass, is happening right in our planetary backyard, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The sources pinpoint a very specific trajectory near Mars. It's definitely not going to hit Mars. No collision risk. Okay, you're good to know. But it's close enough that we can point basically the best robotic eyes we have out there at it. How close are we talking? It's set to pass within about 29 million kilometers of Mars. Right, 29 million. Which, okay, still sounds like a massive distance. It does, but you need to ground that number. Like you said, yeah. it's roughly 75 times the Earth-Moon distance. Okay. But given how vast space is and how fast this comet is moving, the fact that five different spacecraft can coordinate to observe it in that tight window, it's actually quite astonishing. Yeah, that really puts the logistics into perspective. Mm -hmm. And the key date. October 3rd, 2025. That's the date for the close approach. October 3rd. And that proximity creates this vital observation window for well, pretty much every major space agency with assets orbiting Mars. Exactly. And this is where the story gets really interesting, because it's not just one agency. This isn't just NASA's show or ESA's show. No, it's truly a global watch. The level of multinational coordination here really underlines how important, how scientifically critical these interstellar events are. It's one of the biggest coordinated observation efforts ever for something just passing through a ride. You could definitely say that for a transient object like this. Yeah. Okay, so walk us through the fleet. Who answered the call? Who's pointing their instruments at 3IA TLS? Well, we've got assets from uh, several major players. NASA's leading with its veteran Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO. MRO, right. Known for its amazing high-res images. And its atmospheric analysis tools, yeah. Then the European Space Agency, ESA, they're dedicating two spacecraft. Two. Their long-serving Mars Express and also the ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. Ah, the Trace Gas Orbiter. Isn't that usually hunting for methane, signs of potential Martian life? That's its primary mission, yes. So, you know, redirecting it to look at a comet. That shows how big a deal this is. A massive shift in priorities. Absolutely highlights the scientific urgency. And then rounding out the group, we have assets from the UAE, the HOPE probe. HOPE normally studies the Martian atmosphere, seasons, and weather, right? Correct. And also China's Tianwen-1 orbiter. Wow. So USA, Europe, UAE, China. Yeah. Getting all those nations, all those different spacecraft, aimed at the same tiny fleeting target on the same day. It's a huge logistical achievement and a diplomatic one, too, frankly. No kidding. Coordinating five international spacecraft is a massive undertaking. And yeah, they're not doing it just to get pretty pictures. Definitely not. The source material highlights a couple of features, specific things about this comet that have the science community really buzzing. What are they hoping to learn? 
The goals are very specific. They want high-res images, yes, but also spectral data. They're trying to study two really unusual features of 3i at least. Unusual how? Features that strongly suggest this object is fundamentally different from the comets we're used to, the ones born here in our own solar system. Okay, lay them out for us. What are these anomalies? So the first big one scientists are focusing on is a detection of uh, extreme nickel emissions. Nickel. Coming from the coma, the gas cloud. Exactly. Emanating from the coma. Nickel, you know, it's a heavy metallic element. That feels weird. Nickel. For a comet, I thought they were mostly ice and dust, dirty snowballs, volatiles. That's the standard picture, and that's why this is such a shock. Finding extreme nickel like this suggests a very specific and probably very hot formation history back in its home system. Hotter than where our comets form. Likely much hotter, or at least a different chemical environment. Our standard models predict lighter stuff boiling off. Seeing significant heavy metals like nickel really challenges those models. So does it mean the comet itself is packed with nickel? Or maybe it formed super close to its star? Both are possibilities they're considering. Either it's incredibly rich in nickel compounds, or maybe it formed much closer to its parent star, where higher temperatures allowed these heavier elements to condense into solids. But hang on, if this thing came from a totally different star system, how sure can scientists be that their models, which are based on our solar system, can even interpret these nickel signals correctly? Are you flying blind a bit here? That is the million dollar question, really. That's driving the urgency. The sources confirm scientists know this is tricky, right? which is why they're throwing every spectrometer they have at it. They need multiple readings, different wavelengths, to try and separate the actual interstellar nickel signal from you know, background noise or effects from our own sun. It sounds like a real analytical challenge. It's an analytical tightrope walk, absolutely. But the potential reward, understanding how diverse other star systems might be, is totally worth that risk. Okay, fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, anomaly one, mm. heavy metal emissions where they shouldn't be. Mm. What's the second weird thing they're looking at? The second feature is about its shape or morphology, how it's outgassing. The sources mention a highly unusual trait, a sunward pointing coma. Wait, say that again? Sunward pointing, isn't that backward? Uh -huh. Comets approach the sun, the solar wind hits them, and it blows the gas and dust away from the sun. That's like Comet 101. It is standard physics, yes. Uh -huh. So to see a coma, the gas cloud, developing a structure that seems to point into the solar wind, towards the sun. Mm. That's fundamentally counterintuitive, a complete reversal. It really is. It suggests something incredibly dynamic is happening, maybe a bizarre shape to the nucleus itself, or uh -huh. maybe even some kind of localized magnetic field interacting weirdly with the solar wind. Wow. Okay, so we've got heavy metal weirdness and directional physics weirdness. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you had to pick which one of those, the nickel or the sunward coma, is the bigger scientific headache right now based on the sources? Oh, good question. I think. I think the sunward coma might be the bigger immediate mystery. Why that one? Because it seems to defy basic forces we thought we fully understood, at least within our solar system environment. The nickel is compositionally strange, yes, but the coma structure is dynamically strange. And together. And when you put them together, you realize 3 eyed Alice isn't just chemically different, it's behaving differently as it interacts with our sun and solar wind. It's like a truly foreign object, chemically and physically. Okay, let's shift gears slightly to the logistics. Massive international effort, data pouring in. Yeah. But the sources mention a wrinkle. A fascinating snag regarding getting the data out quickly, particularly from the U.S. side. Yeah, there's a very real-world complication playing out. The source material notes that the current U.S. government shutdown is having an impact. Nah. Now, good. crucially, the mission operations themselves, flying the spacecraft, collecting the data that's all continuing, essential staff are on the job. So the data is being gathered by MRO, for instance. No interruption there. Correct. The collection isn't stopped. But getting that data out to the public, or maybe even smoothly, to all the international partners, that's being held up by the shutdown rules. Things like website updates, non-essential comms. Precisely. NASA's ability to update its public websites or distribute information broadly is hampered. But, and this is important, the sources are very clear, the mission itself won't be compromised. The data will get out. If NASA can't push it out easily? We through the international partners. The sources specifically mention the European Space Agency, ESA. So ESA is kind of acting as the main data hub or funnel for the time being. Essentially, yes, for ensuring immediate global access. Does the source material suggest any, like, 
tension there or logistical strain from shifting that huge data distribution role to ESA on short notice? The sources seem to emphasize cooperation over strain. Because this was planned as a multinational effort from the get-go, the data sharing protocols were already pretty solid. Ah, okay, so they had groundwork laid. Exactly. By routing the big data packets, especially all that spectral analysis, through partners like ESA, they make sure the whole global science community gets it quickly. No big delays in the analysis phase. That's actually a fantastic example of scientific collaboration working around bureaucratic hurdles, isn't it? especially during a crunch time like this. It really is quite inspiring, especially given the scale of the scientific opportunity here. Okay, we've covered a ton of cosmic ground pretty fast today. Let's just recap the core points. We have 3i ATLS, interstellar comet number three. Making this really precise flyby of Mars, peaking around October 3rd. And it's being watched by this amazing multinational fleet, MRO, Mars Express, ExoMars, TGO, HOPE, TN11. And the big scientific mysteries driving all this effort are those really weird features, the extreme nickel emissions. Suggesting a totally different formation history. Right. And that bizarre sunward pointing coma, which challenges our basic understanding of how comets interact with the sun. We've really gone from discovery just back in July to this massive global observation campaign right now in October. It's been a fantastic deep dive into the sources on this. It really has shown how quickly the scientific community can mobilize for something this unique. The sources definitely gave us a solid grasp of this high stakes event. And if we try to connect this back to the, you know, the really big picture, the whole reason for this huge rapid effort is that features like those seen on 3 Aeolus, they challenge our standard models of how stars and planets and comets form everywhere. They show us things might be very different out there. Exactly. The sources make it clear these visitors from deep space aren't just copies of our own comets. They're chemically unique, physically unique. So considering those extreme nickel emissions and how tough they are to explain, here's the final thought for you to chew on. Okay. What might the really deep analysis of this comet spectra once it's all process tell us about the actual conditions, the specific elements, the density, the temperature in its home star system thousands of light years away, especially what conditions could possibly create such heavy metal rich objects wandering through space? That knowledge, that glimpse into another stellar nursery, it's right there within the grasp of that fleet orbiting Mars right now. 